You know, Marley was dead to begin with. Those are the opening words of Charles Dickens' story called A Christmas Carol. I hope you're familiar with the story today. Uh, it was actually written in just six weeks, and it was published just in time for Christmas. He wrote it as he was walking around London at night, and it became an instant classic. It sold out before Christmas Eve. And uh, you know the story. It tells the story of, of a miserable, old, stingy businessman named Ebenezer Scrooge who really is just mad at the world. And he thinks Christmas is a waste of time and a waste of money. The story starts on Christmas Eve when three spirits come to visit Scrooge and show him scenes of Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas future where he can see how his greed has led him to live a lonely, miserable life. By the way, did you know the word um, miser comes from the word miserable? If you're stingy, you're not going to be joyful. In fact, even the, the Dr. Seuss story that, that is so popular today, rising in popularity, it seems like. I see the Grinch everywhere. How the Grinch Stole Christmas was actually inspired by a Christmas carol. There are more than, I mean, this is a silly number, more than 100 versions of the story. There's a video game. There's, there's a, even a zombie version of A Christmas Carol, for those of you who are into that sort of thing. It's, I, you know, multiple versions of the story come out every single year. I was wondering, which one's your favorite? You have a favorite Christmas Carol, Christmas Carol movie um, Screen Rant this past week put out a list of the top whatever, 40 or so Christmas Carol um, mo in interpretations. You, you should definitely put it on your Christmas watch list, one of these. But number 11 was uh, one called Mrs. Scrooge, Miss Scrooge that came out in 1997. In 2004, Kelsey Grammer, who you may know as Frasier, made a musical version in 19, uh, no, not 19, 2022. Uh, Netflix released a cartoon musical version. Of course, a lot of people love Bill Murray's Scrooged from the 80s. There's the 1970 Albert Finney musicals number, comes in at number four. But the number one that Screen Rant said, this is number one, I'm in total agreement. It's really uncontested best version of A Christmas Carol is The Muppets Christmas Carol, yes. And with Michael Caine, brilliant performance, you know. It's so great, so great. And if you know the story, you know um, how Marley comes back from the dead and, he, and, and, and you see these spirits of, of Christmas past, Christmas present, Christmas future. Well, today, as we are continuing our Christmas sermon series called A Thrill of Hope, I want us to look at what I found to be a sort of biblical Christmas carol that's found in one of Paul's New Testament letters called, uh, the, the letter is Titus, Titus chapter two, uh, verse, beginning in verse 11. And what, what's happening in Titus, this is one of Paul's letters that he's writing of training and of encouragement to a young pastor named Titus. And here, in, in these few verses, we're gonna see the true spirit of Christmas past, present, and future. And so grab your Bible if you brought your Bible. I want us to stand together as we read God's word today. We're gonna read this, this brief passage here. It's starting in verse 11, and it says this. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people, and we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. 
He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. All right, have a seat. Let's get into this. Let's get into this. In this series, what we're talking about is how do we live with hope in the middle of a hopeless world? And I I know that when we look at the landscape of our world today, there are so many ways that it's hard to find hope. But today, we're going to find out what God says about how we can shine our light of hope in the middle of a dark world. Listen, if you know Jesus, you know hope. If you know Jesus, you know hope. Followers of Jesus can be and should be the most hopeful people on the planet because we have the greatest hope that there is. So I want to just just getting back to that Christmas carol thing and Marley, I was looking at at this scene where he tells, Marley's ghost tells Scrooge, he says, I'm here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, a chance and hope of my procuring, I guess he's saying, that I can offer. And Scrooge says, you were always a good friend to me. And the ghost says, you will be haunted by three spirits. Scrooge's countenance fell almost as low as the ghost had done. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? He demanded in a faltering voice. It is. Scrooge says, I think I'd rather not. And the ghost says, without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path that I've walked. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. So it's all about hope. It's all about hope. And the the same thing can be said about us today when we're in need of hope. The reason this Christmas story has become a classic is because I think there's a little bit of Scrooge in all of us. We've all got a little bit of bah humbug and a little bit of cynicism and and a lot of selfishness. But until we see the past, present, and future of Christmas, we don't have any real hope. So let's look at the first spirit today. I have hope from Christmas past. My hope comes from Christmas past. Maybe you think of the Christmases that you've had growing up, and and maybe you can remember some of the, the... the times that you've had at Christmas, but Paul was pointing us all the way back to the very first Christmas when God became a man in the form of a little baby in a manger. And that's what Paul is saying here in Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. He calls it the grace. He calls him, Jesus, the grace of of God. But did you know that the word grace, that word is the, also the word gift? See, grace is a gift, a free gift from our generous God. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. And what kinds of gifts does he give us? He, he gives us the gift of forgiveness because of his grace. He gives us the gift of hope. And at just the right time in history, he wrapped up the perfect Christmas gift when Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes and placed in a manger, which was a feeding trough for animals in the middle of a stable. And without this free gift from God, we would have no hope. We would have absolutely no hope because we could never save ourselves. So when was the grace of God revealed so that people could be saved from their sin? He was revealed when Jesus was born in Bethlehem at just the right time, at just the right place, with just the right people. Because for us today, Christmas is like, yeah, we get it. Jesus was born into the world. And we don't think about that as as hoping because it's already happened. But for thousands of years, it wasn't that way. God's people were desperately Hoping, looking forward to Jesus, to the Messiah coming into the darkness of the world. And it was a time of hopelessness and darkness and silence. And, and so God was sending during that time, he, he, sent, 
his prophets to tell people that God was going to send a savior into the world. And one of those prophets was a, a man named Micah. And here's what Micah said in Micah 5.2. He said, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Don't despise the small things. Great things come from small places, right? Yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. And so we see that at just the right time in history, Jesus was born in the exact place, the town of Bethlehem, that this prophet predicted 700 years before it actually took place. And if you look in the Old Testament, there are dozens of prophecies about the Messiah. The Old Testament gave us this perfect fingerprint of what the Messiah was gonna be like and who he would be, and Jesus came along and he perfectly matched and fit that fingerprint. Jesus' life is a checklist of these prophecies. He was born of a virgin. He was born in Bethlehem. He was born from the line of Jesse and, and of King David, of the tribe of Judah. Shepherds and kings would worship him. And there was the prophecy that the king would kill all the little baby boys under two years old. And that his earthly father, Joseph, would run away with Jesus and escape to Egypt. And those are just the prophecies that uh, refer to Jesus' birth that prove that he is who he says he is. And if you're, you know, skeptical, you might look at all this and you say, well, maybe Jesus, you know, maybe this guy, he manipulated all these prophecies so his life could fit all of these different prophecies. But you have no control over your life when you're a baby and where you're born and all of these things, right? And the true story of Jesus being born gives us incredible hope as we look back because it shows us that today, even when our world seems to be out of control, we can see clearly that God is actually ordering the events of the world. Even when the world looks kind of scary and, 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 you know, God is in control. He's in control even of what's going on in the, with the politicians and the government. We see this in this story that we can have hope in our lives today because we see that God has been faithful in the past and so we know he's faithful today. And God has a bigger purpose that is going on that he's writing behind the scenes that we can't even see. But it's not just the past where we get our hope. I, I can also have hope in Christmas present. We really need hope for today, right? Because today is where we all are living. God doesn't want us to walk around defeated and hopeless because he's given us the power of his spirit at work in our lives. He's shown us how he wants us to live our lives today. And this next verse in Titus 2 is about how do we face Christmas present? What do we do today? How do we live for God today? And verse 12 says, and we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. So how do we do that? How do we do it? Paul says it's living for God. Being wise, being righteous, being devoted, not giving in to your temptations, which what does that do? That, that leaves you drained. It leaves you more hopeless than before. And you may say, well, how is it hopeful just to obey God? It reminds me of this guy. He was out. He got lost wandering in the desert, and he was literally dying of thirst. And somehow, miraculously, he stumbled across an old rusty water pump in the desert with a small, maybe like this, you know, just a small, probably not this much water, small bottle of water sitting next to it with a little note that was attached to it that said, the pump works 
but you will, you will need to prime it by pouring the entire bottle of water into the pump. And when you do that, you will have all the water you need. Now, he had a tough choice to make then because he's out in the middle of the desert. He could drink that little bottle of water and maybe survive for a couple more hours or he could pour the whole bottle down the pump, down the pump and, and he, he could, it, it could release gallons of water for him to drink. And he chose trust and hope. And when he poured that water down the pump and then he started pumping it first, it was like, uh-oh, what's happening? Nothing's happening. But then pretty soon, that water started flowing and he was saved. That's what it's like, trusting God today by obeying him, doing what he says. You're living with hope because when you do, when you obey him, you, you've got to trust him. You've got to live by hope in God to trust that even though you may want to do things your way, that God's way is always better. There's a higher way to live. And when you obey God today, God promises blessings for your life tomorrow. That's living with hope today. Even though, you know, God never promises that you're not going to go through problems, you're not going to go through trouble, he does promise this. This is a great promise from God in Psalm 138.8. Check it out. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. What concerns me today? God knows what concerns you. And he promises he's gonna take care of it. Your faithfulness, Lord, is everlasting. And whatever it is you're dealing with today, you can know that God can handle it. He's powerful enough. He's big enough. He loves you enough. You can trust him, not only today, but also tomorrow and every day in the future. You can have hope for Christmas future. And this is the part I really was excited about getting to today, about the future. I'm talking about the great hope that we have for the future. You see, just like God's people waited and waited and waited for so many years for the day when Jesus was born into the world, now we're in a place and a time where we find ourselves waiting again. Only this time, we're waiting for that great day when Jesus returns again, when he comes back at his second coming. That is hope for Christmas future. And in fact, our, our verse, our power verse is, is here in this passage we read. It's Titus 2.13. If you have your, your power verse card, pull that out. We want to say this out loud with a lot of excitement and hope and volume. Here we go. We are filled with hope as we wait for the glorious return of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we wait, we're waiting for that moment and it fills us with hope. It fills us with hope. What are we hoping for when Jesus comes back? Because listen, it's gonna be different the next time he comes than the last time that he, he, he came to earth. The first time Jesus came to earth, some wise men bowed before him. But when Jesus comes back again, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The first time Jesus came, it was a silent night. When Jesus comes back again, it will be with a loud shout, with the blast of the trumpet, with, with a worldwide celebration. The first time Jesus came, there was a star that shone above Bethlehem. When Jesus comes back, Jesus himself will shine brightly in all his glory for all the world to see. The first time Jesus came to earth, some people in a little town called Bethlehem knew about it. But when Jesus comes back again, every tribe, tongue, and nation will know about it. The first time that Jesus came to earth, he paid the price for our sin. When Jesus comes back again, he will do away with sin and sickness and separation. The first time Jesus came to earth, he came to make peace between God and people. 
And when Jesus comes back again, he is coming to win the war against all the forces and everyone who opposes God. So we have great hope. We are living today with the certain hope that we will be in the presence of Jesus, that we will have a great family reunion with all of our loved ones who have trusted in Jesus, who've gone before us. We have hope that we will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and brought into our eternal home that Jesus has been preparing for us. So we need to be prepared. That's living with hope, getting prepared for what God is prepared for you. And there are two ways I want us to talk about that we can be prepared today, that we can prepare and prepare our lives. And the first one is with our testimony, okay? It's through our testimony. What is your testimony? Well, in a court case, when you're called to testify, to give a testimony, what do you do? You just tell about what you've witnessed. You tell about what you've seen and about what you've heard. That is your testimony. Your testimony is your personal story of what Jesus has done in your life. It goes something like this. Before I knew Jesus, here's what my life was like. I I didn't have much hope for my future. I didn't know that God had such a good plan for my life. But then, but then I heard about Jesus. How did you hear about Jesus? Somebody told you that Jesus was not only born into the world at Christmas, but he also gave his life and he died on a cross for your sin. And he didn't stay dead, but he rose again on the third day and he is alive and living today. And I received Jesus into my life by trusting him, by turning away from my sin and by turning to Jesus and trusting him and he saved me. And now here's the difference that Jesus has made in my life. That is your testimony. Nobody can argue with your testimony because it's your experience. It's what God has done in your life. That's how you give people hope. And if you're following Jesus, then your life is gonna look very different People are gonna notice the difference in your life. They're gonna see that that you have hope in the middle of a world that can be pretty hopeless and they will want to know why is your life so different? Well, 1 Peter 3.15 says this, instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life and if someone asks you about your hope As a believer, always be ready to explain it. Always be ready to explain it. That doesn't mean that you have to know all the answers, though you should be learning and you should be growing. But but it means that you know the answer, and the answer is Jesus. And you can tell your story. You know your story better than anybody else. And you can also invite them to church with you. You can invite them to Connection Christmas next Saturday or next Sunday. So we live in preparation by bringing along as many people with us as we can to heaven. And then another thing that we can do is um, to prepare is to use our treasure. We use our treasure. Remember, in the Christmas carol, it was all about moving from greed to generosity. We, we learn that Christmas is really about giving, that God loved us so much that he gave his only son, right? We're never more like God than when we're generous, than when we're giving. And Christmas is about giving, not getting. What is our treasure? Our treasure is all the resources and the, the, the finances that we have, the money that we have that God pours into our life. And we don't put our hope in money, right? We don't put our hope in money because money talks. It says goodbye. And our hope is in our bank account. It's not in our wallet. It's not our salary. It is in God. 
Here's how Jesus said it in Matthew 6, 19. He said, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So how do you do that? How do you store your treasures in heaven? Well, the way you do it is by investing your money in the kingdom of God because that money is what fuels our mission that we have been given to reach as many people as we can for Jesus as quickly as we can. And then all, what, what happens to your treasure? Once people come to know Jesus, then your treasure is there in the people who will be there in heaven. Jesus is saying, when you use your money and you invest it in people who come to know Jesus, which people is what will last forever. People were made to live forever. And so you're investing in eternity. You're making an eternal difference. And when you get to heaven, they'll say, thank you. I'm here because of what you did, that you made a difference in my life. And Jesus says in another story, he tells that they will welcome you in. They'll say something like, you gave to that church, you gave to the Connection Church, who then gave it to the missionaries in, in the Philippines and in Guatemala and in India. And a missionary came and told me about Jesus. And I'm here because you gave. Or you gave to that church that put that parking lot in, in, in San Marcos. And I, I noticed that, and, and it made more room for me to come in. And so I was able to come to the Connection Church in San Marcos, and I gave my life to Jesus. You gave to the church and in Buda, and you bought that 11 and a half acres of land where they built that beautiful place that, that we call home, and, and it made a difference in so many generations to come. In fact, someone may say, I'm your great-grandson, and I'm now in heaven because you were so generous back in Christmas of 2023, because now I know Jesus, and that's our hope for the future. It's, that it's in future generations of Christians who are not even born yet. So right now, we're, we're gonna put that into practice in our lives by bringing our Heart of Christmas offerings. And this is really one of the most powerful moments that we have every year. It seems very simple, walking to the front, placing, placing an envelope in a, in a basket. But as pastor, I know many of your stories and I know what you faced this year. I know this year has not been easy for so many of us, the things, the challenges that we've gone through, and yet God has been so faithful, and it's so beautiful to say, God, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you. I'm putting you at the center of my Christmas. I'm putting my hope in you. In fact, my situation that I'm going through right now, it hasn't even all come together yet, but God, I'm trusting you, and I'm hoping, and I'm putting my hope in you, and I'm trusting you, and I'm worshiping you, and I'm placing you at the center of my family. And so, in just a moment, you can bring your uh, Christmas offering to these baskets at the front, this physical act. We think that's so important that we're doing something physical besides just passing a bucket. But some of you, you say, well, I've given online. I've already given online or you're gonna give online. Well, I would encourage you to grab an envelope. It could be an empty envelope, it's okay. And you can bring that forward just as an act of, uh, you might write on there, here's, you know, I'm giving online. Do that and you can drop that in but it's a way for all of us to participate. And so what I want us to do right now is let's hold our envelopes up in the air. In fact, you can stand up. Why don't we stand as we do this? Let's pray over this, this offering. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for the way that you've blessed us, God. Blessed our families. God, we thank you that 
we recognize that in the middle of a world that is singing songs about all I want for Christmas is you, God, that we're saying, Jesus, you're the one we need. You're the center of our Christmas. You're the center of our families and our lives. And so we are asking you, bless this, you multiply it, you use it, God, for your purpose, um, that you're working through our church and around the world. And I pray a blessing on everyone as they give today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can begin coming forward now. And hey, I'm not done with the sermon, so, so don't, don't be leaving, okay? <laughs> sacrificially because Jesus gave his life sacrificially for us. There's one more verse that I wanted us to look at just as we land, and that is in Titus 2.14 that said, he, Jesus, gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people totally committed to doing good deeds. Jesus was born into the world and he gave his life so that we could have life, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have a reason to live today, so that we could have a family. He says, I'm bringing you into a family. I call you my very own people. And as we even thinking back to the story that we've been talking about in this message, the Christmas Carol, you know what happened in his life? He was changed in a moment. His life was radically changed. Sometimes we give up hope that our life can be any different than, than it was before. But what Jesus says is, I, I've, I can change you. I make you new from the inside out. And I want you to live a different kind of life that is lived for his glory. I wonder if you've ever made that step in your life to receive the forgiveness and the family and the future that Jesus has for you. You can do that today. I want us to close in that prayer to give us an opportunity because I know there's some here who say, I need Jesus in my heart and my life. And if that is you today, if that is you today, just with every head bowed, would you lift your hand in the air today and say, today is my day of putting my faith, my trust in Jesus, receiving his free gift of salvation. If that's you today, you can pray a prayer like this to say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for giving your life on the cross for me. Today I'm giving you the pieces of my life in exchange for your peace, for your hope. I ask that you would change me from the inside out, make me part of your forever family. Help me to follow after you from now on as you fill me with your spirit. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen.